can you hear us? Yes, I can. How are you? We're good. We're good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me do the official introductions. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening, the one and only Anne Serling, the daughter of Rod Serling and author of the book, As I Knew Him, Rod Serling. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Thank you so much. I want you to know it's an extreme honor to have you on because of all the people that, that really had an effect on me and, and possibly even had something to do with what I do as a career, it was your father. Your father was an iconic man. Thank you so much. It's, um, you know, I'm so grateful to hear that. I hear that from a lot of people, and it's, it's so touching, and, and I know my dad would have been so moved by that, so thank you. Well, in light of the fact that, of course, CBS owns and always has owned Twilight Zone, and they're doing a reboot, and there's a whole lot of publicity about that, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk about the original host, as far as I'm concerned, the only host, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you what you think of the new project with Jordan Peele as the host. Well, um, you know, it's not my dad. I, I didn't, I wish him luck. I didn't watch the original reboot, to be perfectly honest. I don't know. You know, I've, I've talked to friends about this, and their response is, well, you know, again, it's, it's not your dad. Mm -hmm. So, I, But, you know, I think my father, again, quite honored and quite surprised that the Twilight Zone has survived as long as it has. Really? I mean, for a show that started out in the 60s to have it still be shown as much as it is, it is incredible. You know, talking about the reboots, of course, it's not the only TV reboot. Uh, there was two other reboots that I know of. Uh, the one that I thought was quite appropriate was when it was narrated by Burgess Meredith, because Burgess was in several episodes of your dad's show. Yes, he was, yeah. One, one being Time Enough at Last, which, of course, is one of the, I think, best episodes. Right, definitely. It's actually uh, my favorite episode of The Twilight Zone. Um, I want to ask you, though, Anne, and I know you go into this in your book, uh, but talk a little bit about Rod Serling, the man, because what fans know is we know that he was a genius, incredibly smart, incredibly talented, but we have this image in our head of the host of The Twilight Zone who was very staunch and stiff and matter-of-fact and in, almost intimidating at times. What was Rod the dad like? Well, that was in part why I wrote the book, because, you know, he, he was, some perceived him as sort of this dark, uh, image and uh, there had been some things said that he was a tortured soul and you know I saw this sort of as an opportunity to set the record straight that that wasn't remotely familiar to the of the father that I knew or that friends knew he was brilliantly funny um, he was a practical joker he was um, just you know when when you're a teenager, sometimes you go through a phase where you don't want to be around your parents, and I never felt like that with my dad, nor did my friends. He was just so much fun, just a hell of a nice guy. Mm -hmm. I think probably the one thing that most fans want to know is in talking about the way that he was perceived on camera, uh, staunch and, and kind of stiff, and I'm not saying this as an insult because it so worked for him, the way he stood there. And, and and had his arms crossed with a cigarette and was very straightforward and, and very serious. Now, you say that he wasn't like that at home, but what about his speaking manner, the voice that we heard as the TV host? Did he pretty much sound like that at home? I mean, it wouldn't, of course, when he was joking around, but was that his uh, normal speech pattern? No, in fact, I, I, have, I did tease him about that. That was, I mean, it was and it wasn't, but that was... Uh, more of a professional voice than the voice that was at home. I, he was also quite silly, so, mm -hmm. you know, the voice, the, <laughs> the dad voice was very different. Right. Well, what about the image itself? Because, like, uh, the way that, like I said, once again, his image in black and white was indelible in everyone's minds. Uh, the image that he gave across on camera, which, as you said, is very different than, than what he portrayed at home, was that something that he created in his mind? Was that something he created himself? Or was it uh, through the advice of, of uh, MGM and the people that produced the show for CBS? 
who was the one that created that persona that, that we saw on camera? Was it Rod himself? or? Well, originally he wasn't scheduled to even be the, the host. Um, they had or- Orson Welles, I think, was one of the first, and um, it proved too expensive to have Orson Welles. So my dad volunteered, and it was sort of met with, uh, I think, skeptics skepticism that you know he w- he really wouldn't be able to do it and he did and mm-hmm. you know I guess the rest is history but I think I'd also heard that he was quite nervous when he first um, began that so that may have been also what you saw you know initially too that and then it worked I, you know right right definitely well I wanted to talk a little bit about also uh, where your dad came from in his writing and if you were ever had conversations with him about it or you were aware of this because one of the things obviously that's very important about the twilight zone and why it it lasts to this day is that it taught you things it had moral lessons and a lot of times there was a lot of episodes that were very anti-war which a lot of people found to be interesting because your dad was actually a decorated veteran, right? Right, right. And in fact, before the war, he wasn't even going to be a writer. Mm-hmm. Um, it was after the war he was like every vet, so traumatized. And of course, back then, they didn't really have a term for it. There was nothing like post-traumatic stress disorder. I think it was called... Um, uh, uh, I can't remember the term, but, you know, that they didn't talk about it at all when they got out. And um, my dad was going to teach phys ed to kids because, yeah, shell shock, I, it just came to me. Um, mm. He was going to teach phys ed to kids because he liked working with kids. But then when he started at Antioch College, he was, he was just so devastated and broken that he switched his major... Um, to language and literature, and he said, "I ha- He said that he had to write. He had to get it off his chest. He had to get it out of his gut. So, so you and would... also, his father died. His dad died when he was overseas. So there was mm. that trauma too. That right. um, and he and even though the war was over, he didn't have enough points to come home. And he was always resentful of the Red Cross because I guess they had made that decision. But again, there was no closure. So he had the trauma of his dad dying." and the trauma of the war. You know, a, a lot of questions I like to ask fantasy uh, writers, uh, writers in horror and, and sci-fi and fantasy and all that, is, is what scares you, and, and I guess you pretty much answered the question as far as your father, in, in the fact that he had long-lasting effects from having been in the war and fighting the Japanese uh, at the time, and I guess he literally had physical nightmares where he would wake up screaming, is that right? Yes, I, that, I, that's what I remember. He never really talked about any of his experience. In fact, I have a friend whose dad would be uh, my, my father's same age, and just when he uh, was in his 80s, he began to talk about what had happened. But I remember vividly my dad, I would hear him screaming in the middle of the night, and when I would ask him in the morning what happened, he would tell me that he had dreamt that the enemy was coming at him. Wow. Are so, you- yeah, it was a lot of... You, you said that it, it helped him get a lot of that off his chest and that in the writing, so I would assume that a lot of those episodes we saw that were themes, such as the one with George Takai from Star Trek and so on, that, that, that a lot of that influenced his writing in Twilight Zone. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Again, right, getting it off his chest, yeah. Now, I know he had some troubles later on when he did Night Gallery, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But when he turned around, and, and knowing that they originally wanted Orson Welles as the host, when he started uh, and, and and doing a Twilight Zone and that, were they pretty hands off? Did they pretty much let him do what he wanted to? I'd almost think they would have to, considering he wrote like what ninety two of the scripts. Yeah, ninety two of one hundred and fifty six. Yeah, he had complete creative control. Mm-hmm. You know, it was entirely his baby. Um, uh, he was the producer, and and he owned Cayuga Productions. That was very different for Night Gallery. He, he didn't have creative control, and it turned into something that, you know, was sort of a lot of horror and, and not what he had envisioned it to be. So it was a, a disappointment. A, a lot of them were a disappointment, and I think he was glad when he got out of that 
But, you know, that said, there were some great shows, like Tim Riley, they're tearing down Tim Riley's bar, which yeah. was either nominated for an Emmy or it won an Emmy, but that was a beautiful script, a little bit like Walking Distance from The Twilight Zone. Yeah, there we recently saw, I don't know if you know about this, there was some DVD release or something, and we saw it on Amazon Prime or something like that, and it was supposed to be undone scripts that your dad wrote, and it was narrated by somebody else, it was turned into a movie. I don't even know if you're familiar with this, but there was some scripts that I felt was for Twilight Zone, and there was some that I felt was for Night Gallery. Was there some that he wrote for Night Gallery, like with Twilight Zone, that never got aired? Um, scripts that he wrote for Night Gallery that didn't get aired? Yes. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Um, I'm not positive about that answer. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing with, with Night Gallery that what was interesting to me is, is uh, definitely more horror. We was uh, in a, a period in a genre that time when horror was popular. I guess that was their decision. Uh, so you said basically, and I want to get this clear, that there was kind of a battle that Rod really kind of wanted to do Twilight Zone over again and have it be more fantasy and then the people at MCA they wanted uh, horror is that correct? Yeah it, it just became a different animal than my dad had envisioned it or anticipated it would be so and again he didn't have the creative control that he had over Twilight Zone so that was problematic Right, right. Well I wanted to ask you uh, what because I, we follow you on Twitter um, and we saw a couple of recent tweets that you had put up, and you had said that there are moments when you were glad that your dad doesn't see the world today. And uh, there's been a lot of murmuring because the Twilight Zone has been kind of invoked in the Kavanaugh hearings. Uh, where, do you, where do you think your dad would stand on all of that, and what do you think that your dad would think of kind of the state of affairs today? Well... I'll just come out and say it. He would be apoplectic about what's go. happening in the world. Mm. Yeah, he'd be um, tremendously saddened. And, uh, yeah, so I, I am quite discouraged, I think. But, you know, I think also he wouldn't just give up. He would he would say, you know, the people really need to come together and, and get out of this mess. Well, I know one thing he, he definitely stood for. We, uh, just before you came on, played an interview he did with Mike Wallace, and he was talking about censorship. He was very much against censorship, wasn't he? Yes, and, and he had to battle that for, for many, many years. And, you know, I often think today, you know, the freedom that he would have had would be so, so very different. I mean, he was, uh, I, I can't even imagine what he would be producing now. And it leads to great things to imagine, that's for sure. Uh, you know, everybody knows that Twilight Zone and everybody knows Night Gallery, but he actually had written other series. He wrote a Western series, didn't he? Yes, yeah, called The Loner. Hmm. Boy, I got to look that up. I, I wasn't even aware that, that existed. That's incredible. I've definitely got to be looking that up. So, what about Rod's yeah, background? I want to know. Wait, wait. Go ahead. I was just going to say the loner didn't survive very long, but uh, he had high hopes for that as well. Right. I was wondering, you know, talking about how the loner didn't survive very long and that, what was, I know he wrote other things. He wrote great uh, drama and started out writing drama before he wrote uh, fantasy and this and that. Was he ever kind of upset that he was kind of typecast in that Twilight Zone kind of fantasy sci-fi mode I mean did he want to be recognized more as a serious writer because he wrote a lot of serious stuff too well I don't know if I'd say well I think you know the Twilight Zone was pretty serious I think though that he would have said and I think he did say that he he wished that he was remembered um, more for his earlier work as well you know Mm -hmm. Patterns and Requiem for a Heavyweight but he is essentially known as um you know, the Twilight Zone guy. Right. Well, uh, you know, one thing, too, that was really great about the show is, of course, I mentioned Bur- Burgess Meredith that did uh, more than one episode, and he would use other writers, or at least the studio or the production would use other writers, such as Charles Beaumont. Did he have favorite actors and favorite other writers of the show? You know, it was 
from what I understand, a really seamless team of writers. It was Earl Hamner and Richard Matheson yeah. uh, and Charles Beaumont, as you said. I don't know the answer to favorite actors. I know um, Jack Klugman was in several, and, I, and Jack Klugman said really lovely things about my father. So I think the fact that he was in at least, I think, three indicates that, you know, that was a pretty good relationship. Well, in knowing that, and I wanted to ask you kind of the feedback you've gotten, because in knowing that your dad uh, was so instrumental in the industry and was so loved, uh, what kind of feedback has your book gotten from maybe some of the contemporaries that Rod had worked with? Um, well, I just actually just heard from a man who wrote uh, Robert. Uh, Redford's biography. So I've I've heard lovely things uh, from him and Carol Burnett and Robert Redford, and um, it's also the readers that I hear from who really identified with the grief aspect. Uh, you know, the unresolved grief, and and that's another thing that I hear too. Yeah, we should not forget that Carol Burnett was in one of my favorite Twilight Zone episodes, which was more of a comedic episode. So she was a Twilight Zone alumni. Yes, absolutely. And and just a lovely, lovely woman. It, and knowing that he wrote all types of stories, and of course you said and verified he was a very funny man, uh, of the ones that he wrote, and, and there were several I can think of, when the Martians come in the bar and so on, what what was comedy to him? I mean, was that something that he enjoyed in, you know, infusing into the Twilight Zone and writing? Because, you know, like you said, it was a very serious show and very dramatic, but every once in a while there'd be a comedy, uh, probably fewer than dramatic, but did he like doing the comedy stuff for Twilight Zone? You know, that's an interesting question because I think the comedy, the comedic ones really didn't work, in my opinion. Uh -huh. um, and that surprises me because he was so funny. But I think um, it was really the serious ones that worked better. And he, he told a writing class that he had a propensity to write about the past. And I personally think those are, are the best ones. You know, uh, again, Walking Distance, A Stop at Willoughby, um, and then that night gallery one I mentioned before, they're tearing down to Miley Farr. Yeah. But it, I think a lot of that also was, again, his, you know, the, that he hadn't resolved his father's death, and he had had this incredibly idyllic childhood growing up in upstate New York. And, of course, you know, the war put an end to all of that. Right. Do you think so that... Always that do you think that I was maybe, just going to say... I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say there was always that desire to go back in time. Right, right. To his childhood home. I was going to ask, do you think that maybe uh, some of the comedic episodes not working as well was possibly also because of the, the attitude or the impression that the audience may have had in their mind about Rod. A perfect example of this is, is because we are, you know, such big Twilight Zone fans, we're so used to seeing him as he introduces the show. We had looked up a couple of months ago uh, an old episode of Tell It to Groucho. It was on YouTube. And your dad was a guest on the show. And he was on there and he was smiling and joking and laughing and very jovial. But it, it, was, it seemed weird to us because we were so used to that image. Do you think that that might have had a part in why maybe some of the comedic episodes didn't come off as well? I think that's, I think you're probably spot on, yes. Right. It was a surprise to see him break from that serious, you know, intense guy, I guess. Now, it would have been a surprise to you if you would have recently <laughs> seen it, because I'm sure you were too young to, to have seen it when it first aired, talking about Tell to Groucho. But I want to talk more because you mentioned this, and I think we should go into it more because I just, I love this image so much about your dad being the funny man at home. Now, am I right in knowing that he used to reenact Gone with the Wind and play different characters? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, he would, and, and, you know, as, as my friend wrote in, in my book, anything became a prop, you know, when my mother's <laughs> scarf and anything he could grab. Yeah. Just, you know, he was, he was very, very silly. Which was, you know, one of the things that made him so endearing. Yes. Right. Well, I guess he kind of even used that episode in writing The Twilight Zone. Did he not kind of 
verbally reenact the episodes in the dictaphone uh, when he was writing to, to, to be transcribed later? Yes, absolutely. But whatever that worked for him, up. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's perfect. And, 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 and talking a little bit more about uh, Rod and his sense of humor, that I guess, first of all, it's so tremendous that he was only married once, and that was to your mother, Carol, okay? And, and you have a sister, and, and the family man that he was, I guess it wasn't beneath him to get down on the floor and play with the dogs. Is that right? <laughs> right. Yeah, the story was that when we'd have company over, that would be the signal to my mother that he was tired. <laughs> he'd get on the floor and start rolling around with the dogs. <laughs> That's incredible. I want to know, uh, th- th- I just love this whole image you're giving because this is important that people know this about him because just in that little brief video I saw on Talented Groucho, I could just see that, that warmth and that humor. You could tell that he was a real real family man. I, I want to know about his habits of what he liked. Now, I, I could imagine him reading books on, on government and history or whatever, at least I think he probably would. But what about TV shows and movies? What kind of stuff did he like? One would think or maybe fantasize that, oh, he just watches sci-fi and fantasy, but I, I got a feeling he probably had a lot more depth than that. What did he watch as a viewer of TV and movies? Well, I'll tell you, he did like the Flintstones. <laughs> <laughs> And he used to watch a lot of old war movies. Uh, I remember watching Mannix with him. Uh, what other shows? I can't think of any. You know, the cartoons he would he would watch, like the Flintstones that I just said, and Augie Doggy. Uh, <laughs> I would I would almost get this impression as he's watching the Flintstones, uh, maybe Tom and Jerry or, or you know Fred and Barney or whatever that he would probably try to explain a morality lesson to, to you. Well, <laughs> right. <laughs> now, his writing habits, I know he had often, often commented on the fact that when he got the series of Twilight Zone, he had to produce so much and, and had to write, you know, just really fast and everything because everything was amped up and all that. Now, he had an office there at home and then later built an office in the backyard uh, basically, he'd go there early in the morning, but he'd be there for supper. Is that right? I mean, what was a day like for Rod Serling in, in his writing habits and how he created and then became the family man afterwards? Yeah, he, we had, he had an office in the house. I don't really remember that. I was quite young then. And then he built one in the backyard, and he would get up very early in the morning, have his black coffee with sugar, and then go out into the office and, and work. Um, but most of the writing occurred in the early, early morning, and then occasionally he'd drive over to the set. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't like to interfere with the actors, so he sort of stayed out of the picture so he wouldn't make them nervous. Right. Did That's he... I, that, I don't remember hearing that directly from him, and I didn't really know that. I actually heard that years later. Right. Did he really have any input? Now, you said he had pretty much total creative control as far as the series of The Twilight Zone, where of course he didn't, unfortunately, with Night Gallery. MCA is sometimes a little hard to deal with from what I understood back in the day. Uh, but did he have any control or any say as to the actors that were in his shows in Twilight Zone? Oh, he must He must have, absolutely. I mean, he, he owned the production company, and um, so absolutely, I'm, I'm certain he must have. Now, I, I remember from way back when I was a kid watching Twilight Zone, and I always saw, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing it right, Cayuga Productions. Now, that that has something yeah. to do with where he came from, right? Right. Uh, the Cayuga Lake is upstate, and, and he grew up in Binghamton, New York, also upstate, about an hour and a half away. Wow. He, he was born in Syracuse and moved to Binghamton when I think he was two or three. I can imagine he hated Los Angeles when he had to move out here. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and we would come east every summer because there's a summer cottage on my mother's side of the family, and it was always a tremendous relief for all of us, but I think particularly my dad because, you know, this is pre-cell phone and all of that, so it was really an opportunity for him to completely unwind and, and get out of the mayhem from Lo- of Los Angeles, although... Yeah. He would occasionally have to fly back. Right. Well, I'm so happy 
that you know the, the same goes and, and definitely goes with you the apple doesn't fall out far from the tree in the fact that, that you have become a writer and of course you wrote the book on your dad and now I understand uh, are you not currently involved in writing some fiction? Well, I'm, I'm writing a novel and um, I'll, I'll quote something my dad said about the last project that he worked on. It's beginning to destroy me piecemeal. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's a whole different animal and it's something I've been working on for several years but we'll see. What what's the maybe this is why it is you know it leads to my next question. What would it be like for Rod Serling's daughter, whose father was the greatest writer in the world, and now you're going to be compared? I mean, it's one thing to write an autobiography, okay, but to write fiction, you're going to be compared. You're going to be scrutinized. How do you feel about that? Is that something that puts a fear in you? Well, you know, I was very, actually, I was wary of that when I wrote the memoir because I thought, you know, I'm really putting myself out there and not in a uh, form that I'm tremendously comfortable in. And, but I didn't get that kind of feedback. Of course, you know, fiction is, is very different. Yeah. I have novelized a couple of my dad's Twilight Zone years ago. So I have done that, and, and that was kind of risky, but I got good feedback. Um, but we'll see. Hopefully, you know that I can be my own person. So now, when you were when you were, when you were growing up, uh, did I, I'm, I'm assuming that you wrote? I believe the notes said that you wrote and things in in your teen years. And as you were growing up, uh, did your dad read any of that? What did he think about your writing? Yeah, I I didn't write uh, stories. I wrote a lot of pretty <laughs> pretty lousy poetry back then. <laughs> Um, and, I w- and, I would, and I would share it with my dad, and I always knew if he liked it because he would say that it was interesting, or he, he would go on about it for several days if he liked it. If he didn't like it, he would tell me it was interesting. <laughs> so I sort of knew. <laughs> so that was his key word to, to be nice, but not <laughs> to say it's interesting. I love that. <clears throat> That's fascinating. i got to find out because knowing how you're the daughter of Rod Surly now, to me... And maybe most people, he was so iconic and such an inspiration and and kind of intimidating. As I said, I've got to know when you had a date show up to pick you up and Rod Serling answers the door, (laughs) especially if they didn't know. Was there any crazy reactions? It it could be. um, You know, my friends would be very wary. And then, you know, but again, five minutes in my dad's company and, and... my friends would feel so relaxed and uh it you know he just again he was not the image projected on television and that was quite obvious when when you were in his company for just a few minutes right so so basically your 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 friends knew the real you and knew your dad and you didn't have people that was afraid to befriend you at school because they thought maybe you were creepy or something (laughs) kind of spooky that's actually quite true because I remember when I started college and, and I overheard somebody say th- who my father was and, you know, some snide remark about, I can't remember what it was, but it was kind of nasty. Uh-huh. Um, but there was that, you know, there was that. I was telling people on the show here, and a lot of people only seem to associate him with the Twilight Zone and Night Gallery, that he did so many other things. Did he not write the screen adaption to Planet of the Apes? Uh, he was the original writer uh, on that, and he t- had tried to stay very true to the novel. Yeah. And it proved to be too expensive, so they brought, I think it was Michael Wilson, the other writer. Mm-hmm. But uh, a lot of my dad's writing is still in that, and of course the iconic ending was his. Right, right. Well, another project... Oh. Go ahead. I-, I was just going to say, he also wrote something like 250 scripts, um, you know, in the time that he was a writer before he died, um, you know, from 1950 uh, until 1975. And he's been described as, as a comet because he was so prolific in, in such a short amount of time. Right. right. Well, one of the other projects uh, that, that Rod was responsible for that I don't think a lot of people know about. It's kind of lost. It, tell us a little bit about what a carol for another Christmas is. Right, that was to commemorate the United Nations, and um, he was—I uh, think that was for CBS. 
and um, yeah, at, uh, yeah, it was for the United Nations. Well, I got to look that up. Peter, yeah, Peter Peter Sellers was in it. Wow. And you know, he was talking about how you know everybody needs to get involved, and again. Everybody, every time at Christmas, they bring out their Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Rankin-Bass episodes, and this and that, Frosty the Snowman. My favorite thing to show at Christmas is the Twilight Zone Christmas episode with Art Carney. Now, th- that was magic. Night of the Meek, right. Yeah, that yeah. was the one Twilight Zone that we watched every Christmas. We would go out in his office in the backyard and, and uh, watch that. It's a, that's a great episode. For sure. Well, you know, I know that, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that he also was involved in, in some kind of uh, productions of answering questions uh, about in search of kind of like the, the unknown and this and that. Did did your father believe in aliens and other worlds? Uh, did he believe in, in life on other planets or uh, supernatural uh, entities at all? You know, it's not a discussion that we ever had. I'm sure he was probably very open-minded, but, um, you know, when when he was a kid, he liked uh, amazing stories and Poe, and so, again, he would be open to something like that. But, you know, I I don't think that he could have taken it that seriously, given that we never really had many conversations about it. You know, we were talking about your, your first writings, and you adapted... Uh, his stories in, into what wound up appearing uh, in the Twilight Zone publications. Is that still in publication today? Because I know there was a Twilight Zone old TR, old time radio play thing going on. Are those two things still going on? or? Um, I don't believe so. Hmm. Well, that's too but bad. But I believe, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you're still uh, on the board of trustees for the Memorial Foundation, right? Right, the Rod Sterling Memorial Foundation, yes. I'm sorry, was that what you were asking before? I, sometimes our phone cuts out and I can't hear it. We've been having problems this morning. I, I hope you can hear me. Oh, no, we can hear you fine. We can hear you fine. Yeah, we, I was asking if, uh, if the Memorial Foundation is still active and you're still on the board. Yes, I am. Yeah, it was actually started by um, a group of my dad's friends from, uh, that he'd gone to school with. And, and Helen Foley was uh, his teacher, who actually had en- really encouraged him. He, she was his English teacher, and she, I think she was actually the one who began it. Wow. Right, right. Well, you know, I, I miss him so much, and uh, I guess it was a heart attack that took your dad. I, I, you know, it, it's amazing it wasn't smoking, because he smoked so much. Did he smoke that much at home? Yeah, he was, uh, it was tough he was constantly smoking and of course back then you know people did smoke a lot more but it was something that my sister and i really bugged him about and actually threw away cartons of cigarettes uh his dad also died quite young his dad was 52 also a smoker so my father had had a heart attack and then uh had another heart attack and that's when they decided to do open heart surgery which of course back then was a very very new procedure right. uh, he survived the surgery but uh, when they closed him up he had an, another heart attack so he survived about three days and you know it would have been a very different ending today is what I'm trying to say right. well you know I can almost hear your dad talking in my head not really I'm kidding I'm not a psychic or anything but I can almost hear him saying in my head you know, in watching the Flintstones as well. The Flintstones did a cigarette commercial, so if it's good <laughs> enough for them, it's good enough for me. So, but okay. su- such well, a great I would like loss. To talk a little bit, uh, if, in, if you don't mind, um, because you do mention the grief that you went through when when your father passed. You were only like twenty years old. Um, so, talk a little bit about that and. My other main question to this is, I know that you wrote the memoir many, many, many years later, decades later after his passing, but uh, did you find that it was therapeutic like when your dad would write to get stuff off his chest? Absolutely. In fact, um, a few years after he died, I I tried to write then, and I wrote a book called 
in his absence, which I had not even, I realized I had not even begun to navigate that whole grief minefield. So it took me many, many years to finally write um, as I knew him. It's interesting because before I had completed the book, I was invited to the Paley Center to give a reading, Mm -hmm. and a woman came up to me afterwards and she told me that her father was dying, and after hearing me read, she knew that she'd be okay. And I was so touched that, you know, something I had said had, you know, had this significance to her that I couldn't even speak to her. All I could do was hug her. But, um, so yes, to answer your question, it, it did help. But, you know, and it, it, I think what, it, all, it took me seven years to write that book, and, um, but it was a joy every day to spend that time with him, you know, to go back and revisit all those memories and have him with me daily. I know you mentioned, at least I read my notes, you mentioned somewhere that a lot of times how you remember your dad is, is not only glimpses of memory, but in something you see or, or something that you smell or whatever. Is, is there any certain things in your daily life that really reminds you of your dad? Um, my children, I guess I would say. Yeah. I, um, they both have a certain kind of sense of humor that reminds me of my father, and then, of course, I think... You know, the, what my, I vividly remember my father saying to me is, if only you had known your grandfather. And, of course, I couldn't imagine that I would one day say the same thing to my kids. Yeah. Right. But certainly um, my own children, and we still go to this summer cottage that my dad loved, and he's there. I don't go to his grave very often because he's not there. Yeah. But, um, right. Definitely. Well, you know, i, I got to ask you this because it's amazing that a lot of times we've interviewed uh, different people at their home and this and that for the show, as well as the magazine we write for. And a lot of times they don't have stuff uh, from the show, posters or whatever. Do you have anything around uh, of your father? Because we've got Twilight Zone posters on the wall <laughs> here. Uh, and, and the other question is, if you can answer them both, uh, did he or did he keep, have, or do you have now from him, did he have any props from the show? Uh, please tell me he had talking Tina because I want to know. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have that, um, and fortunately, he didn't write that episode, so <laughs> which made me feel a lot better when I finally saw it. Right. But, uh, <laughs> um, I did talk about the uh, dummy that he brought home from the show of the same title. Oh yes. And of course, we hadn't. We hadn't seen that episode, and you know, he just he brought this home, and we just thought it was wonderful. And we sat it up at the table, and my sister and I fought over it. And then years later, I did see that episode, which of course was terrifying. And uh, you know, he was this malevolent character. But uh, no, we I don't have any props. I think my sister has the masks or some uh, form of that, but mm-hmm. I don't really have anything. Yeah, there was the episode where they all wore masks. It was characteristics of the kind of person they were. Uh, which leads right. into a question. The Twilight Zone, towards the end, was turned from a 30-minute show to a 60-minute show. And instead of film, it, it, it went to videotape. Did your dad ever comment on how he felt about that? Because that's really flipping it around. Yeah, I think the fact that that didn't last was indicative of nobody was very happy with that yeah well you know definitely the the earlier episodes i think are the best uh i asked you about and we're we're almost near to the end of this i asked you about the the tv reincarnations what about that 80s movie with dan Aykroyd, twilight zone the movie now you either love it or you hate it how do you feel uh yeah well of course you know the terrible accident um really colored that yeah uh, I wasn't tremendously thrilled with it. My favorite one act uh, was uh, Kick the Can, <coughs> which oh, my yeah. dad had not seen that episode. But I loved the music so much in the movie that I played it at my wedding. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. That's excellent. Did yeah. your dad ever say what his favorite episode was? Well, again, you know, as he said, he had a propensity to write about the past. So I'm sure that Walking Distance and the fact that we watch Night of the Meek every Christmas 
I've heard that one of his favorite episodes was Time Enough at Last. I don't remember him saying that. And yeah. I, I've had talks with uh, a friend of mine, Mark DeWitziak, who wrote Everything I Need to Know I Learned About the Twilight Zone, and we both agree that uh, that that Time Enough at Last wasn't really a fair episode. I mean, that was a really decent, nice guy. Why the hell did that have to happen? Right. <laughs> Well, I, I must say that, that I've got every single episode, and I'm not lying, Every I've got the DVD box sets and everything, and I was really excited when uh, Disneyland honored your father and did Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, and, and I was the first one there, and then they had the video, and, and they threw some very clever editing, you know, use your father's image and everything. Uh, did you ride uh, the Disney's Tower of Terror ride? I did. Uh, when they opened it, we had to ride it several times, and I'm not, that is like not totally not my thing to be dropped in the air like that. <laughs> so I was completely terrified. Yeah. Uh, and it didn't get easier. You know, I think we had to ride it like four times, and um, yeah, it was quite scary. Yeah, the ride was scary, but what was scarier for me was when I went to the gift shop and, and created a scene complaining that all of the merchandise had Mickey Mouse on it <laughs> rather than having your dad straight out, you know, image and logo. I wanted more Rod Serling souvenirs, and it, it was more <laughs> Disney-fied, and yeah. I almost got thrown out because of that, but I, I'm a Die Hard fan. Uh, so as we kind of wrap this up, Anne, uh, I want to ask you uh, about uh, the long-lasting Serling legacy. The thing that is amazing to me is that, you know, for decades and generations after, everybody knows the Twilight Zone. You'll talk to somebody who's a baby boomer who watched it when it was uh, first came out. You'll talk to people that are college age that still watch it. Uh, what do you think about that long-lasting legacy of the show and of your dad's? And what do you think your dad would have thought about how many, how much it's lasted over the decades? Well, I think my father would be absolutely stunned. Uh, the Writers Guild voted it one of the three top shows several years ago, and he, I think he would have been particularly honored by that. But I think, you know, it, it has survived so long because he, you know, he dealt with the human condition, and unfortunately, we don't change a whole lot, and, you know, there's still uh, prejudice that, and, you know, so many things wrong, but uh, that's why it survived. There, there's a program in Binghamton um, called The Fifth Dimension, and all the fifth graders watch The Twilight Zones, and they learn about scapegoating and mob mentality and prejudice and... Uh, these kids, it's really pretty amazing. It's stunning, actually, that they really get this. And I think my dad would have felt that that was uh, just a tremendous accolade. They, yeah. This program's been going on for 12 years. You know, I'm so we've glad. Also, Go ahead. I was just going to say, we've also uh, reprinted uh, eight of my dad's. He novelized several of the Twilight Zones, and we've reprinted those that are... Uh, so, you know, he would have been, I think, more surprised than anybody. He, he wanted, he said once that he wanted to be remembered as a writer, but he, he felt that his writing was momentarily adequate, I think is what he said. It, it, he didn't think it would stand the test of time. Right. Well, you know, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I was going to say that I was, oh, God, I, I felt so great when they did that classroom thing because I remembered... It would, like, when the, the Sci-Fi Channel was running the episodes specifically, I remember, like, 2, 3 in the morning at some obscure hour, they would show an episode and they would have the leader on it telling teachers and classrooms that they have the rights to record the episode to show in their classroom. And I'm thinking, damn, what an honor for your father to know that they are using these episodes to enlighten, entertain, and educate children because your father was a teacher. And what a great thing to know that even after his death, he was still teaching children. I, absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Wow. And, and decades, decades after his death. And 
for and you know it's the 60th anniversary next October of the Twilight Zone. So yeah, he would just be stunned. So you had talked about releasing of of some of his novelizations of some of his scripts. Now, is there anything? that you and the foundation's working on that we can look forward to, like maybe for the 60th anniversary or whatever that you can tell us about? Well, we'll probably do some kind of event in Binghamton next year, and uh, Nick Parisi has just released a book that that, uh, talks about all of my dad's writing. It's a really comprehensive work that he's done. Um, So that's actually just available on Amazon as well. I think it's something like 600 or 700 pages. He did extensive research. Right. Well, I, I think it's very unfortunate. I think that, that CBS, uh, which is going to be on CBS All Access with, with Jordan Peele, that's probably the most unfortunate thing, choosing Jordan Peele, in my opinion. But I wish they would have... I don't, I, you, know, I think, I, I, you know, he's talented. I'm not going to take that away. And, uh-huh. you know, again, I just... I'm protective and possessive so I'm probably not the best person to ask about how I feel about a reboot because again it's you know it's not my dad and I feel like this was his baby right if they would have asked you to be a consultant or 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 to write or to write for the show would you do that and and if you were a consultant these are two questions would, would you do it and the other question is if you had to sit down and you had your initial meeting with the execs and you had to consult, what would you tell them? And it's probably a hard question. You pretty much maybe answered it. I don't know. What would you tell them that they need to do to to give it that rod twist to know that it had the warmth and, and the content and, and everything that, that made that original show what it was? Well, I think, again... I, I don't know that you can redo that. I mean, it's, the fact that it had this lasting, uh, you know, for decades, the Twilight Zone has lasted, and the issues that he dealt with way back when are still relevant and prevalent today. So, you know, and what's missing in a reboot? My dad. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, he had the greatest voice, and, and uh, I guess we had with the show a couple of weeks ago, said that your your father had the voice of a thousand men and that's true such an iconic voice and it's so great to know uh, i'm a big fan of of radio of course being in radio that he started out in radio too and i mean you, you can tell that he had that whole history behind him as such a great announcing voice and and, and yeah. there was there was no host like like rod serling you can be proud yeah. and i know you are i, thank I am you. proud and he you know he wrote he wrote all of those radio uh, shows, and he acted them out and directed them. So, yeah, that, that voice was a uh, very versatile voice. <laughs> I, I found out in my notes, there's a few things I have to look up, that he did a Jack Benny episode, <laughs> <laughs> and his character was like Mr. Zone or something like that. <laughs> and, and he did a few other acting roles, too. I mean, did, did he ever tell you that he liked doing the acting thing I mean maybe that could have been a whole other thing for him that he didn't dwell into quite as much I, well I don't I don't really remember that um, as a kid I know he was in an episode of Iron Five uh, I didn't really know that he wanted to be an actor but you know like you said he was on a couple of shows and I think that was a great fun for him yeah now, uh, just as we wrap up here, I, I don't know how old your children are, um, but your children, who would have been Rod's grandchildren, uh, how much do they know or have they learned about their granddad and who he was in the annals of pop culture history? Well, um, you know, they've learned really the personal side from me, and then, of course, watching the Twilight Zone. Um, you know, they'll for, they form their own opinions, but again, they they know who the dad was. Right. What What about your husband? Was he a Rod Serling fan? Was he a Twilight Zone fan? Uh, it's funny when we first met. My husband is from Canada, so I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think he was. One. But, but he, uh, I, I guess he did his uh, 
some point. But, you know, we didn't, we talked about my dad a lot, actually, because when I met him, I was still really grieving. Mm -hmm. But more, again, about the personal dad than the professional person. Right. Wow. Well, uh, once again, the book that Anne has uh, written, it came out a few years ago. It's called As I Knew Him, Rod Serling. Where can people pick up a copy of the book? And is there a website or something that they can get a signed copy of the book, signed by you? And is it still available? Yeah, it's on Amazon, and it can, and I have a website also, com, and it's also, uh, I can be contacted on Rod Serling Book. And my Facebook is Ann Serling Book. And what about... I can, and I, go ahead. On Rod Serling Books, I can do signed copies as well. Perfect. Well, I know like a lot of times there, there's signings and conventions and fan gatherings. Do you ever go to any in-person things? I mean, other than book signings, do you ever do like a comic con or something like that? Yeah, I've done uh, several of those in um, Monster, uh, Monster Palooza, I can't remember. Um, yeah, those are fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really interesting because you meet the nicest people at those events. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you got to know, you're like a friend automatically. You don't know these people, but you are their friend. Yes. Because of your dad. And, and yeah. I, I, I know like, like your husband is so lucky to get to marry you because <laughs> you, you come from good stock. You come from good stock. I'll remind you. I'll remind him that you said that. <laughs> yes, and, 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 and let me tell you, I don't think I have to tell you this, but, but you had described writing this new fiction and, and some of the, the, the perils or whatever you're going through. Just sit back and relax, since I'm going to tell you something, man. Your dad's in you, and you've got the talent, and you've got the history, and you've got his lineage, and you're going to be surprised at what great things are going to come out of you. Oh, that's so kind. Thank you. I appreciate that more than I can say. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you, Anne, so much for spending some time with us, not only to talk about your life and the memoir, but also to share your stories about your dad with us. I don't think anybody has to let you know this, but, you know, Rod was a very special person. The, the landscape of history and would not be the same without him and i thank you so much for taking the time to share some of your insight and personal memories of your dad with us on the air oh thank you so much and again he would be so humbled and grateful by what you just said as well a final halloween question i've got to know because halloween's coming up has there ever been any kid come up to your door dressed like rod Zero? <laughs> you know that hasn't happened <laughs> i'm kind of glad <laughs> That might be a little creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I think your dad would have probably felt a little creepy about it, too. Wow. All right. I, I think he probably would have laughed, but uh, wow. more than I would. <laughs> All right. Well, the book is called As I Knew Him. We encourage everybody to check it out. And uh, also make sure to head over to Anne's website at annserling.com. Uh, Anne, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you have a great, a great rest of your weekend and a happy Halloween. It's coming up in 11 days. Yes, thank you, and you too. All right, thank you. Have a great night. Okay, bye-bye.